right. Well, welcome to everyone that's here. Um, my name's Brett Lim. I'm here to do just a quick talk about Verified Exec. Just do some crowd interaction first for what there is in the crowd. Uh, this is, this is going to be a one. Who's, who's heard of NetBSD? Stick their hands up. Come on, don't be shy. I didn't hear your question. Yep. Yeah. I missed your question. Oh, sorry. Who's, yeah, that's, that's right. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm told that I do have an accent, so <laughs> if I do say something that you don't quite understand, just wave at me and I'll try and speak, <laughs> speak more clo clearly for you. Uh, I, so who, who's actually heard of NetBSD? Yeah, everybody? Good, good. Okay, who's heard of Verified Exec? Not so many. Who's actually used? Cool. Apple. All right. So that's good. We'll do a bit of a sell job and see if we see if we can convince some other people to to use it or not. Uh, all right. We'll just start off from give it a bit of a history about where where this came from and where we where where it is now, where we're, where we're going to go with it, maybe. The idea came, around, came about late last century, late last millennium, sounds <laughs> sort of impressive. Um, I was just sort of reading the bug track mailing list at the time. They had a lot of traffic about Trojan horses, libraries being you know, hijacked, rootkits being installed on the machines. That was start of start of the problem. So I guess it's, they weren't new ideas, but it certainly was starting to become more prevalent. And I was just watching this and thinking, why? Why should the kernel? run any random bit of software that's thrown at it. It seems to be fairly cooperative and no way to really control what was happening on the machine. And so I started thinking, well, why is this? Why do we allow this to happen? Should we stop it? Can we stop it? Um, we just assume if somebody's root, then well, you know you can't stop it because you know, they can override permissions on, on things, just run whatever they like. So we needed a mechanism for actually trying to stop people from from doing this. Uh, that's. Basically, where the where the idea came from, and just thinking about how how to do that, it's how can you actually identify a file that you want to to be running or reading? How do you know that this is one that you know, hasn't been modified or one that? You know nothing about. So I started thinking about this, and well, maybe we need to have a list of files, something about a file that the kernel can tell what, whether the well, whether the file has been modified or whether it's something that it doesn't know about. So the first idea was we needed something. That, List of fingerprints in the in the kernel to to actually help it identify what that it should know about. It didn't know about when the then when the, the file was accessed, that fingerprint could be evaluated on the on the on disk file. And that could be compared with the in kernel list 
And if the two match, then we can be fairly confident that the file hasn't been modified and it's one that we know about. And we, we can be confident that it's something that we want to run or it's something we want to read. So I did a, an initial cut of this, of this idea after, after much head scratching. I uh, finally got something that, that actually worked. And the obvious problem that we've got here is that it was slow. I did a comparison of running a kernel build without the modification, with modification, 1.7 times slower. Big, big performance hit. Not really surprising because not only are you reading the, the entire file all the time to so you can evaluate the, the fingerprint every time it's exact or, or, the, or some files are opened. The other nasty thing that it did was killed the demand paging. So that put us back to the good old system five days when you would run a binary, you would suck it all into memory and then start throwing out the that weren't used rather than the, the more modern way of just bringing in pages as they were, as they were required. Uh, so that had a big impact on the, on the performance as well uh, and is fairly, fairly negative. So what I, I did to actually mitigate that was once the, once the file's been read, the you know, fingerprint's been evaluated, you can mark that off, tick it off in the, in the list saying, yeah, we've looked at that file once. And allowing for some provisos on that, we don't need to check that file again because we've checked it, we know it's good, next time through, we could actually, we can just actually Run the run the thing, knowing that we've we've gone through the checks, which means that the the problems with the with the performance with your page, your demand paging, and also having to do the evaluation goes goes down. And with doing the caching, we've got a performance in, impact of about five percent, um, which wasn't too bad. Uh, especially given the originally the, the implementation just used a single list, linear list of fingerprints and would just search through there every time looking, looking for it, which was a bit sucky, but it was simple and it worked. So that's, that was what I, I did initially. Uh, right. We, the, with, the prob with the caching, this gives us an immediate problem. If you don't control the storage that file is on, then somebody can actually go behind the kernel's back, modify the storage, then request that, that file to be executed looks up in its list and says, oh, I've checked that already. That's fine. I'll just load it in. And already you just bypassed the, the whole idea of the verified exec that it just right, has no idea if the, if the files are being modified. It's not really a problem with storage that the kernel has direct access to. So all your direct attached disk is fine because the kernel's, kernel knows about that, knows if the files have been modified. So actually what, what verified exec will do if the, at some levels it will actually just clear the, clear the uh, cached, I've checked this file, if the file gets modified at some levels. So 
If it knows, then it'll, it'll actually force a re-evaluation if the file gets modified. It's a problem for NFS because you can't actually control the server. So people can overwrite the files. It's also a problem for SAN. Uh, not to the same extent, but if the SAN administrator allows storage to be accessed by another machine and somebody's determined enough, then they can, they can actually modify the file. So that, that was a problem. Now, I'll talk about some approaches of fixing that later. But at the time, I just decided that the boundary of trust for verified exec was just going to be the, the case of the machine, if you like. But, yes, sir? Do you want to be interactive or just... Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. In... So there's a couple of questions that uh, Lauren has defined here. So one, you're just signing executables? Not signing. Okay, sorry, you're hashing them? You're hashing them, yes. Okay. So, so this doesn't apply to data file audits? Yes, it does. So where are you storing the hashes? The hashes get uh, on the uh, get loaded into the kernel at boot time, early in boot time. But how are they associated with the file storage? The file path. Is that the sidepath, sidebar? Yeah, there's a um, there's a file that associates. So I'll go through this in a in a little little while. But basically, you the the way it works is you have a have a, a file there that has the file path name, the the hash for the for the for the file, of some flags and and other bits of, of administrivia for for a verified exec. That gets loaded into into the kernel. When it when it gets loaded into the kernel, the the file path gets resolved to the to the actual uh, physical file. The File number on the on the storage. Okay. So the second question is you're hashing the entire file, right? Like yes. So in the case of hash values, do you restore a list of hashes with the permissible hashes so that you could actually verify on pages? Let me get the, okay. that to that. That's that's a very good question, and um, yes, yeah, so I, I I believe I have an answer for you on that much later in the in the presentation. Uh, yes, that was uh, that uh, line there that says there's a fix for this problem more on that later. Hmm? Ah. What's the other one? The dermite. Dermite is. What's happened to? It? Yeah. You all right? I think I just knocked it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, that's that's okay. It's just that we we won't get the recording, and uh, the guys at work will be disappointed about that. Okay, um, as I said before, I, I did an initial implementation of this, and I was quite surprised that it actually worked. Eventually, uh. One of the one of the things that uh, I did pick up during the during the implementation was that the code path for for executing a binary and one that's executing a, a shell script they're, they're different. What happens when you when you execute a, a shell script is that the exec framework looks checks the file. Oh, this is a text file. Finds the finds that got the the hash bang, bin sh or whatever out there. Okay, that's my my shell script interpreter. Exec that and feed the feed the rest of the file into it, which was rather interesting and and it, it gave me the opportunity to to create a feature that. I hadn't really thought about initially, and it was some, and something that I'll, I'll talk a bit more about in a little while. The code was finally committed to NetBSD tree 
late in 2002. And it was, uh, at, the, at the time, it was, it was basically functional. Uh, it went into the tree. With, there were people who started helping out and making improvements to it. And it's actually become a lot more refined than it was in the, in the initial one. The kernel codes had a lot of improvements. As I, as I mentioned before, the, the original implementation was just a, a linear list, which it didn't seem to have too much of an impact, but you can understand that it probably wasn't the most efficient thing to do. That was switched to using a hash table so that you the file lookups became a lot more efficient. And we switched to using file generation numbers. Originally, I was using inodes, the inode number. Uh, that's very specific to FFS, UFS. And wasn't really, meant that you, you couldn't really support the other file systems very well, by using the, the file generation number, um, all our file systems apart from NFS, and that grew the uh, file generation numbers thanks to uh, one of the other developers. It meant that we could support all the file systems rather than rather than just FFS. Added more fingerprint hash functions. Originally it was just MD5, just because that was what we had at the time. And certainly when I was, I was doing this, there was no real mention of, uh, of hash collisions. Well, no, I think that people were worried about them, but nobody had actually managed to work out how to, how to produce a hash collision. So yeah, having, having more than just MD5 was was a real asset after after the uh, people worked out how to how to generate a, an MD hash collision. So, and I've got a list of the of the hashes that we support later on. So put into the kernel the ability to take out certain hash functions. As I mentioned, the the uh, MD5 one. A lot of people may not, well, some people may not like to, to have that in there just because of the, of the hash, hash collisions. I think that there's a FIPS 140 requirement that you don't have MD5 ability. Yes. You can be there, but you can't use it. This makes sure that you can't use it because it takes it out of the kernel. And the other thing, the other improvement that we did was remove the abuse abuse of unrelated structures. Originally, when I I did this, I, I had a had a look inside the kernel and was. I noticed that the vnode data stayed around for a long time, even with the, if the file's closed, it, the actual vnode does not get recycled for a, quite a while. And so originally what I thought was a really good idea was to actually just add a, an extra to the structure that uh, be used to verified exec to, to keep track of whether the, whether the file's been checked or not, uh, whether, whether it was actually had a, a fingerprint association, I think. And unfortunate thing with that is that the size of the VNode structure changed whether or not you had verified exec on, which wasn't really a good idea. So that got moved, we removed the, 
those entries from, uh, from the VNet um, created a, a file association service inside the, inside the kernel so that you could associate a file number with actually random metadata so that you can, which is what the verified exec uses now instead of instead of the uh, the old v way of using the vnode. So that's gone back to actually just being the same size, whether you've got verified exec on, which made a lot of people happy, I think. Originally when I when I did the the, the loader for the for the fingerprints, it was it was just a, a write only option. You fed the fed the fingerprints into the kernel and the verified exec used them. The tool that we used to do that, the very exec CTL, now has the ability to read back those those entries. So if you the idea is if you if you're going along fixing things up you can do in some of the in some of the lower uh, strictness levels of the of the verified exec, then you you sort of maybe lost track of where you are. You can suck the the actual fingerprint list out of the kernel and say, well this is this is my running set at the moment. It won't give you file names back, but you will you should be able to actually work out what the files are. Um, because that ah that's, that's something I, I didn't mention. If the if the of course if the files are hard linked together, then you might have multiple paths to the same to the same actual physical file. Um, verified exactly just works out from the file number. If the file number already is in the list and the the hashes that you're trying to feed in match, it will just ignore the, the other entry. It's an error if you try and have different hashes for hard linked files, which shouldn't happen. Uh, there's also a convenience tool that was written. It's just a shell script that trawls your your machine, looking for likely files to put into the verified exec executables anything with that's got the exec bit on it will be will be tagged will be added to the list also libraries this is something that I probably didn't mention before but this is where the where the reading files come comes in because you want to share you want to make sure that your shared libraries are also okay it's not just the executable. It's no point in just checking the executable is okay if somebody's going to overwrite one of the libraries and bring in some some trojan that way. So the verified exec will actually check the the shared libraries, what any file read that you you actually tell it to. So the the tool actually goes looking for for all your shared libraries, puts those on the list. You can you can add your own, own things in into there, just random text files if you want. Yes, sir. So where do you validate the shared libraries from the guy I think, or you do it from the when the when the linker actually um, does its work to to get the get the the shared code in, it opens the file and the validation is done at the file open. Yes, yes, kernel's doing all this validation. This is this is one of the things that I was concerned about initially was there were people that were looking at doing library shimming and trying to actually hide their, their tracks by behaving normally for for most of the for for a normal read, but if they if they 
call, library call was called in a certain way, then the malicious code would get executed. Um, so I was concerned about making sure that there was nothing in user level. It's all in the kernel so that so that the they couldn't actually do those those sorts of shimming tricks. So yes, every t the shared library, the dynamic linker opens the shared library on open. If the if it's if it's the file is in in the very exact list, it will get checked. So a simple configuration for the kernel wire memory is uh, actual. Not much. It's I can't I can't say off the top of my head how much, but it's it's not very much. Um, the the verified exec entries are, are only a few hundred bytes each. Uh, is basically it just stores the file number and and the hash, so it's it's not very much much data that needs to needs to be held for each file. I, I think it was only a few pages from so for a large file. Yes, yes. For for a large file, you've got to pay the you pay the penalty for the for the uh, for the first read through the file. After that, you if you if you watch that again, then it will then it will be fine. It will it'll just go through quickly. But yeah, that's the sort of stuff that you've got that you can't can't actually check the file without reading all of it in at one one stage. But if I manage to sidestep the bucket cache and write on the blocks associated with the file to the cache status, even within the block boundaries? Overriding the buffer cache and that I'll get to the idea that I've got about about actually how to how to control page in. That's that's Right, further down the track in the in the talk, it's it's not something we do now, but it's something I'd like to do. Okay, and we also grew a sys control facility for controlling the the ver verified exec subsystem to be able to put it into the different modes. Originally, I. I'd Again, I'd uh, hijacked the secure level and added a couple of secure levels to to uh, do this, but this is a this is a bit cleaner way of doing it, and it's a bit nicer than than just upping the secure level, because it gives you a bit more control over it as well. The sys control will also tell you what. What fingerprint methods are, are supported, so you can actually see what the kernel will will allow you to to load. Yep, depends depends on the on the strict level. I'll get to I'll get to the strict level. That's that's probably in the next slide or so. Um, operationally. We've got to have a kernel that has the verified exec support compiled into it. It's just a, a couple of a couple of options in the in the kernel rebuild, reinstall, boot, and you're away. As I as I mentioned before, you can select the the fingerprint hash methods that you you want to support. It doesn't make too much size difference to the kernel whether you whether you have all the all the fingerprint hashes in there or not. Uh, but it was more for compliance, as I said before. The current oh, okay. sorry, we've got a technical issue. It's not that That's okay. You can keep going. Okay. No worries. Okay, no worries. All right. So the the current 
current hash methods we've got uh, are there R and D when 60, SHA 256, SHA 384, SHA 5112, SHA 1, and MD5. Some of those you probably don't want to use, but they're there just for completion. And I've, as I said before, there's a, there's a little helper tool there that that actually you're able to to run the run on the file system to pick the to generate your file just to just to give you a kickstart you can you can edit that to to suit or add more files into it it doesn't necessarily just have to be shared libraries or or your binaries you can you can put random text files in there if you if you're worried about some configuration files you just stick them in there it'll it'll check them and and validate that they haven't been modified. And then load those fingerprints using uh, very exact C CTL and set the strip level depending on what, what you want to do. Now there are various strict levels that you can have which I don't seem to mention. I think I'll mention the strict levels a bit later. I'll let's go on with that and we'll, we should get there. The fingerprint file, this is to answer a question that we had before. This is it's got this basic format. You've got the the file path type of file or fingerprint method, the actual fingerprint hat, depending on which which uh, hash you've actually decided to, to use, and some flags that determine the behavior of the of very ex exact. The flags, you can have I won't go through all of them. There, there are a whole bunch of them, and if you if you want to, you can have a look at the man page for most of them. But you can get uh, direct, indirect, untrusted, and file. They're, they're the basic ones. There's um, some convenience ones that that are ors of of these these basic ones. The just just quickly, the direct one is. Uh, we'll go through it and throw them in order then. What's the, what the flags mean? Untrusted, which is one I don't like, actually, to be honest. But um, this tells very exact that the this file is on storage that is untrusted that kernel have direct control over. This is this is things like SAN or NFS. It is an evaluation of fingerprint every time, so it. Nobbles or disables the the cache. The idea is that hopefully, if somebody has picked up the or if has modified the file, then the next time it gets, it will actually pick up the change. Fortunately, that's not a complete solution. I'll go through why in a little while, but. Uh, which is why I'm not happy about it, but it's the best we can do at the moment. File is just a plain file, shared libraries, configuration files. So it's telling you, verified exec, that I don't you expect you to be running this file. And then some, some strict levels that, that makes a difference. So it's something that, that is just going to be read. Direct is an executable. This is something that you're going to run from the command line or something like that. It's going to be invoked to, to actually run. Indirect is something that I'll focus on in a little bit. This is an executable that can't be run direct from the command line, but can be a shell interpreter. You can have multiple flags, comma-separated list. 
but as I mentioned, there are some convenience aliases because there are there are some things like if you if you shell script, then you need to tell it very exact that it's a file and that it can be executed. So it will be file and direct. Otherwise, uh, at some strict levels, very, very exact will, will actually deny the execution. Still works, or is it? Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it, it works. Sounds good. Yep. Sounds good. Right. Now, we'll just go through a bit about the direct versus the indirect because it's something that I'm not entirely sure that everybody understands why it's there. As I was saying earlier in the talk, I, I did notice that when, when I was looking at the exec code, that there was a difference between how, how a script is handled and how a binary is executed. And that code path difference may, meant that you, I could distinguish between a shell script and just a normal binary. That, that gave me the, the chance of implementing this indirect and direct. What does that do for us? What that does for us is that we can actually have a shell interpreter on the machine, something like Perl, whatever, but you can't run Perl from the command line. You can have a bunch of Perl scripts for doing administrative stuff. We we'll want to, to run a, a Perl script. Then you can say, OK, sure. Here, here are your Perl scripts. They're in verified exec, so you know they're not modified. The person can run that, that script, and as long as the script is reasonably well written, then you'll be OK. What they won't be able to do is say use a bin Perl minus E from the from the command line and actually be able to pump random commands into Perl. Not that I'm picking on Perl, but that's just just an obvious candidate. And so you get the get the the ability to, to give people Scripting, without giving them the, the the actual scripting shell. You can actually use this, and I've I've done this. It's it's sort of sort of interesting. If you sort of the ex exploits will just try and do a buffer overflow or something, and, and force an exec of bin sh. That's an easy one to do. It's it's a sort of classic technique for for trying to trying to get a shell on the thing. What you can actually do is mark bin sh as, as being an indirect. That means all your startup scripts work, all your shell scripts that you want to run work. Make a copy of the of bin sh if you if you use that as a as a login shell. Make it called something else. Some some other name that's that's hard to guess. It's a bit of a it's a bit of security by obscurity. But if the people don't have access to the machine, then they're not going to know where that is. So you make that copy your login shell. You log in, execs, you get your shell. Happy days. When they try and when somebody tries to do an exploit that says exec bin, bin sh for me. Verified exec says no, because you're trying to do a direct execution. So, just something a little little speed bump for some people. Yes, sir. Can you do this on a per user basis? Or? No, you can't do this on a per user basis. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a system wide thing. So it would be sort of interesting to do that. Would be. Yes, sir. So, is there anything to prevent that user from running uh, the shell interpreter using the different name? No, no, because the, that 
that's that's an allowed executable on the on the thing on the on the computer. So uh, they've got it anyway. Log in, they'll they'll have it. So you're assuming that if you if you're letting them log in with that, then they're they're trusted at some sort of level. Right. Yes, this is this is where we're getting to in the strict level. Once you once you've loaded up the the verified exec, once you've loaded up the the fingerprints into into the kernel, you can then start setting what's called the strict level. And this actually tells the verified exec what you want it to do in certain circumstances. Start it starts with zero which is your initial state, allows the, allows the fingerprints to be loaded. You can update your fingerprints, overload them, and the, and the like. It complains about mismatches. It complains about incorrect file type access. If you recall a few slides back, there was the file type, which was the direct, indirect uh, file flags, they, they have meaning to, to verified exec. If at strict level zero, it will allow you to, to run a binary that's been marked as a file, but it will complain about it. In strict level one, it will deny your access to, to files where the fingerprint mismatches. So at that point, no, you can't you can't execute something or, or read something that that doesn't have a valid fingerprint on it. You're allowed to write to the fingerprint files, but it will clear the clear the cache bit on that so that next time next time that file's accessed, it will give you it will force a reevaluate reevaluation of that. And if your fingerprint mismatches when well, tough. Still allow mismatched file types. Uh, there are a few other restrictions that are detailed in the in the man page. S certainly around around things like access to raw devices and that. Strict level two, which is what you would expect to be using this at when you're gone productive. The, the intention is that you would be running at zero and one just to, to get your fingerprinting tuned up and app. once you're sure that you've covered everything, that, it's, that the machine will operate, you've, you've got rid of all the errors, put it into, into strict mode two, which has all the, all the previous restrictions prevents the, the, the rights of fingerprinted files. So everything on the, on the print list automatically becomes read-only. You can't modify it. It's immutable. It enforces the file type restriction. So at that point, you can't run a text file. If, it, if it's just marked as text, then you won't be able to run that file which is why I was mentioning before the script, then it's a file, and it's also a direct execute. So that tells verified exec, this is a shell script. And there is actually a convenience variable that is automatically all those two together, so you can just say script, and it'll, it'll work. Number three, I don't really expect anybody to seriously use this. It actually has all the all the previous restrictions. You can't open new files. Uh, can't create any new files. It's very, very, very restrictive. You might want to do this if you're really, really sure, and you've got something that's really hardened and 
shipping all its logs off somewhere else and it's just a single user box or a single, not single user, a single application box or something like that. But I don't expect anybody to, well, most people wouldn't be really using that at all. The other thought on that one was that if you suspect that the machine's been breached, then you can you can put it in District Mode 3 to stop anything else happening and do a bit of a forensics before you take the machine down. But I'm not sure that it really would get you used. Any files that you have That's correct. <laughs> yeah, you it's... Really yep, yeah. Yeah, but it, it does mean that you actually get to do that while the machine's running and it's no, no further damage can be done to the machine. That was, that was the argument about... Yeah. Yeah, there's always good old, old firewire. All right. Where it is at the moment, we'll just have a quick run through where it's where I hope that I can get this to go at some stage. It's been a, a long thing. When I bef previously, I had a question at the front here from from somebody about about the the pager, which is a very cooperative beast. The untrusted flag can't actually protect you from a long-running binary being overwritten. What you can do if the, if the attacker has has access to the, the storage, not on the machine, they can actually overwrite pages in the binary. Uh, if that binary is running on the on the very exact machine. Long term, it's something a daemon, something like sendmail. For those people that still run sendmail, uh, then verified exec won't pick that up. Pager will bring those pages into into memory. The attacker can poke the binary, to force force the ex execution of the pages. It sort of sounds sounds like it's a bit far fetched, but I've got a working exploit for this. I've got an NFS server, I've got a binary that I can I can overwrite and reliably just the pager will pull that in and and actually execute the code, uh, the modified code without any detection. And it's not terribly hard to do. The, you just need to force the force the pages out of out of memory on the on the verified exec machine. If you've got access to the machine, then that's that's trivial. Just then map the the file and 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 tell it to flush pages, and they're gone. Uh, if you don't have access to the machine, then it's not really hard either. You just sort of stress the machine until you think the pages are gone out of memory. Uh, So what can we do about that? Trying to, trying to keep the fingerprints for, for all the pages of binary in the, in the configuration file I thought was a bit unwieldy. Make the file huge because every page would have its fingerprint. Really hard to maintain and just, just a mess. When I when I looked at it, I said, "Well, hang on a minute. We're already reading the file in to evaluate the overall fingerprint of the file. So why not, in parallel, just take a fingerprint of each page as that happens? So we do it in parallel. Read the file page by page. We're doing the, doing the overall fingerprint." noting down the, the fingerprints of each, each page. At the bottom, once, we, once we've done the whole file, then if the fingerprint for the whole file matches, 
then we have a set of page fingerprints. And they're, they're all, we can trust that they're good because the, the whole lot actually checked, was validated. If they're, if they're not OK, then the whole lot gets dumped and the, then the file doesn't get executed. Um, so that means that we, we've got, we can just build those, those, uh, those page fingerprints on the, on the fly. That means that you can actually then, I've, I've got a, a kernel modification for this, checks the, modify the, the pages, so as the pages come in for files that have been marked as, as being untrusted, that the per page fingerprints will get, will get checked. And this does actually stop the exploit. I, tried it with my, my little test case and it once the, once the page comes in the page the, the pages that have in that page the the executable actually gets terminated rather abruptly because the had a read error on the on the page. Yes. It is more of a performance hit I haven't actually qualified that, to, to be honest. So it's, you would expect that there's a bit of a performance here. It really depends on how often you're bringing the pages in, how much memory pressure your machine's under. So it's, it would be actually rather hard to quantify because it would depend on what else is happening on the machine. Yes? Oh. Yes, all the all the hashes go into a central a central file that gets. You you have to make it immutable. So you created sort of system at the time, or maybe you create system scale. Yes, you create you create that at system at system image time, uh, or whenever you've updated something. And so you can say, here's my, here's my golden list, if you like, of, of things that I'm going to allow to execute. Yes. Yes, I've, I've thought of putting it elsewhere. I've sort of um, putting it, doing interesting things like actually putting it on the, under the mount point of the, of the system. So that once the file system's mounted, then it's no longer visible. Things like that. I should note, by the way, I'm cheating in this conversation. I worked for Apple for years. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And actually, this is. This is, from what I understand, it was at least used for, for provenance in, in uh, some routers. Also for actually doing feature control as well, because they, they, they were able to do some things that I can't do. Well, I couldn't do, which is what I'm going to, to talk about just now. Uh, future, to, to actually digitally sign the, the fingerprint. So so that you can, you can actually trust that it hasn't been modified. And we allow you to, to modify the fingerprint list while, the, while various, various is in operation rather than having to, to just reboot. Because you can then, because you can trust the, that the fingerprints are from a, from a known good source. The, also, the digitally signed binaries. This was, this was something that I didn't want to do initially, to be honest. I, I wanted verified exec to be able to run on a system without any, without any file modifications. 
at all. So there was no need for anything special in the file for it to run. But another developer has done some work to, to actually do digitally signed binaries and put the, be able to run those with execon. Both of them in, require in kernel crypto, which is a problem for us for quite a while because there wasn't any BSD licensed crypto. That's been addressed. Uh, I can't, re it was, we've imported net PGP, I think. I uh, can't remember why, why the, we took so long to do that, but it was, there was some problems with, with licensing um, and other bits and pieces that prevented us from doing that. There was also a thought that we could actually pre-populate the, the fingerprints for critical things in the kernel, so, so that you could have your, your, some of the files actually protected right from the get-go. One of those could have been the, the verified exec list itself, which is a bit incestuous, but uh, it would work. And that's, that's all I've got. Um, have we got any more questions that haven't come up to the talk? You probably covered them, but just clarification. So I want to know if the executable files change when you create them. The operation is creating or modifying the file. Did it update status? How, how do I know the, the kernel? They have files been changed. Yes, the kernel, the kernel knows that the file's been, been written. If it, if the file's been opened for write, then and the strict level is at the right level, then the verified exec will just uh, clear the flag on it. If it's if it's open for write and then the strict level is is uh, one or above, then it will, then it just says no. Nah, that you get an I/O error when the, when you try and do that. What's well, it says EPERM with permission. Also, in some cases, uh, so this is your inspector or interpreter. So the interpreter, let's say a set UID, uh, the interpreter will run. The set UID is not allowed because the script is modified between the interpreter's range and the, um, and the script is loaded and executed. But uh, I was wondering if, in your case, maybe by using Verisec, you could allow um, set UID scripts because you wouldn't be able to modify it in between. You could do, yes. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's done that. <coughs> like disable no. the set UID check in terms of those scripts. No, I, d I don't know. Uh, but they, it probably would be able to, to do that. Um, yeah, set UID scripts are usually bad anyway. Yeah. I mean, there's other things that have yep. that, but that's one of the reasons. <coughs> hmm. So have you done any experiments with compiling the hashes into the kernel or putting these settings into the kernel, uh, for example, lock-on mode, just setting it right in the kernel? No, I haven't, I haven't tried to, to actually do the pre-population. <coughs> that's, that's something that I'd, I'd like to get to. Really what I'd like to get in first is the, is the per-page stuff. I've had that modification around for a long time, but uh, it's, there's been some push on the on the modifi modifications that I made to the to the pager uh, because the way that NetBSD kernel works, there's, there were places where the where the pager did its work, and I tried to merge those in, and the the final function was a bit complicated and had a lot of a lot of parameters and that wasn't really very well liked. So I need to need to actually rework that a bit and see if I can be a bit smarter in, in how to do that. Okay, that's it. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>